is uh, a real treat for me to um, be here. I want to thank uh, everyone for the invitation. I want to thank everybody for uh, attending. I'm actually bringing up right now my uh, little chat box here. So, oh, and participants box as well. Oh, wow, we got a good crowd. Wonderful. Uh, oh, there's attendees. Okay. Ta da. Wow, look at all these people. This is amazing. What a great event. Three days of just incredible presenters, Fibonacci, GAN, market geometry. I just love, love, love this topic. And it's great to um, be part of it. So uh, as you can see, uh, it says, welcome to the Top Dog Trading Fibonacci Trading Webinar. I'm Barry Burns, owner and founder of Top Dog Trading. Um, I'll introduce myself here in a moment, but first let's make sure that we cover the thing that everybody really came here to see, and that is the legal disclaimer. So I uh, know that's the only reason people piled in today is they're like, hey, I want to see that legal disclaimer stuff. I want to hear more legalese. Well, all uh, joking aside, this, I, I'm not going to read through this word for word, but I do encourage you to do so. And I just want to put a little different perspective on it that maybe you haven't thought about before as to why this really is so important. The regulators require that we put these legal disclaimers out there. So that, first of all, tells you how important it is that we're legally required to do it. Number two, is it is the anti-hype of trading. That's the way I want you to look at it. And I will admit it's not the most entertaining language, um, but again, the intention is to keep you rooted and grounded in the truth of trading, away from the hype, give you realistic expectations, and even what would constitute a legitimate trading strategy and what would not. A lot of trading strategies are really based on uh, falsehoods, things that actually go against these legal disclaimers. So uh, think of it as education and do read through it. You can go to pretty much um, any trading website, uh, including mine, topdogtrading.com, click on the legal disclaimer in the footer, and then go and uh, read through a longer version of this. Highly encourage you to do it for your own purposes. Okay, so uh, there we go. There's my ugly mug. Again, I'm Dr. Barry Burns, owner and founder of Top Dog Trading, professional trader and educator. Uh, I've only started trading about mm, five decades ago. So yeah, been around the block a couple of times. Uh, my dad was a stock trader. So um, actually grew up in Detroit, Michigan. My dad was my first teacher, sat me down at our dining room table um, there in Detroit, Michigan at the ripe old age of eight and said, okay, Barry, time for you to start to learn to trade stocks. I said, all right, dad, that sounds awesome. Cause I'd heard him talk about it all the time. It was his passion in life. And I said, all right, so, oh, by the way, dad, uh, one question. He says, yeah, what's that? I said, what is a stock actually? And, you know, I guess we all start there. And since then, I moved on from stocks. And later, as I grew up, became an adult, uh, I got into futures, e-minis, Forex, and then went into commodities, uh, options, and the last several years, cryptocurrencies. So I pretty much trade all financial markets now and use a lot of the same principles for all of them. Now, there are a few differences, but really the foundation for all of them is pretty much the same. And I got my training after I decided I wanted to you know, do this professionally. Then I went on and got more training at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. I got a apartment out there in Chicago. I uh, went to the CME building every morning and uh, hired the number one trader in our firm to work with me and personally mentor me. And of course, now I give back. I do seminars for retail traders as well as professional traders. I actually went back and, and did uh, a seminar for the CME. And I'm a published author, wrote the book Trend Trading for Dummies. So um my mom says it's the best trading book ever written. So I don't know if that's true or not, but thanks, mom. Appreciate that. 
Uh, something I'm really, really proud of in all seriousness is uh, one of the largest print magazines in technical analysis, perhaps the largest, uh, Technical Analysis of Stocks and Commodities Magazine. I believe they're distributed to over a million people every month. And uh, once a year, they ask their readers to vote on what's helped them over the last 12 months the most. And uh, keep getting Reader's Choice nominations and awards. Uh, this last year, last year, 2021, we got three. So very proud of that because it's voted on by real traders, people like you, not just some committee. Uh, oh, and I give away a lot of free information. So I love to just give free things to the trading community. I've got my podcast. Check that out. Uh, my YouTube videos. Uh, check those out. We're almost, I got to update the slide. We're almost up to 100,000 subscribers now. So very, very um, excited about that. Now, we're going to, I'm going to, uh, the very next slide, I'm going to start talking about Fibonacci. And that's my topic today. And we're going to approach it from several different angles. All right. Not just one, but several different approaches that I use. So uh, hold on, let me just get one thing ready here real quick. <clears throat> okay, had to wet my whistle. In fact, I'll tell you what, you know, I know some of you have been here for all three days, uh, others just one day or two days, but you've heard from a lot of presenters. And so I want to do something that I think is a little unique before I even get into the Fibonacci techniques themselves. Let's talk about something super, super important that can be very, very practical in helping you become a profitable trader. And that is perspective. Okay, so I'm not changing slides right now, just so that everybody knows the uh, Top Dog Trading uh, YouTube channel slide is still up there. And it'll be up there for a few minutes as I talk about this. Because I find that a lot of traders, when they want to become profitable, they're just looking at techniques, tactics, concepts, indicators, things like that. And, and those all have their place for sure. But at the root of success in trading is your approach, your attitude, and here is, you know, most people think, well, I'm trading for the money. I want to make more money. And I even get this question a lot. In fact, I'm going to be doing a podcast on this real soon, might even do a YouTube video on it real soon, where they say, Barry, if you're making money trading, then why do you bother to teach? Why don't you just, you know, just make your money trading while you're teaching? And I always find that question a little disturb disturbing, though I understand why people ask that. And I'm not going to fully address it right now, um, but the reason I find it a little bit disturbing is because the question implies that it's only about the money. And if you're trading only for money, you're going to have a hard time ever becoming profitable. Because, you know, and a lot of people do that. They trade for, it's like a point system. And they see their PL go green, PL go red, goes up 100, goes down 200, goes up 500. It's like numbers, it's like points. It's almost like a video game. You know, they're treating it like a video game. And it's just numbers and, and then dollars. And they want to make the money, honey. And the problem with that is that that's when emotions come in that are detrimental. So, probably most of you have heard that the two primary um, problematic emotions and trading are fear and greed. And that is true if you're trading because you want to make more money. People have fear over money. People are scared of losing money. People are afraid of losing security in the retirement. Fear, 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 fear over money. And greed. I think that one's even more obvious. People get greedy. They want to make more money. Maybe they want to get their Lambos or whatever. Maybe it's probably not that extreme for most people, but they want to make a lot of money. So as long as you're trading for the money, you will have those emotions and those emotions will undermine your trading. I don't care what technique you're trading, whether it's Fibonacci, GAN, indicators, moving averages, candlestick patterns, whatever. You might be a perfect analyst of the markets and of charts, but are you really going to be able to perform? And the answer is most likely not because you've got to apply those things. And, and 
a lot of you have been trading with real money. You have had the experience where your emotions, discipline, or lack of discipline uh, betrays your technical analysis, even if you're great at it. And you find, like St. Paul says in the Bible, the things that I find myself, well, I find that the things I want to do, I'm not doing. And the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. That's a common experience with traders as well as in a lot of life. So to finish up this uh, little part of the presentation, which is unique and not really even official part of the presentation, I just thought, well, with all the other presenters here, I want to bring something unique to the table. Um, and that is this. Trade for a reason bigger than the money, bigger than yourself. So for me, what I did, and my biggest challenge in trading was over trading. I identified my cardinal sin. I was over trading. And so here's what I did. And you can adapt this little um, approach to you personally. Each one of us has to um, individually customize this for ourselves. So I said, okay, as long as I'm focused on the money, I get emotional. Fear, greed, FOMO, FUD. And, and also the other thing for me was I felt like I wasn't really, my profession of trading wasn't contributing anything to the world. I'm just making money for myself, but I'm not really helping anybody else. And for me, that bothered my conscience. I actually went through a crisis of consciousness over this. Uh, conscience, and, and I went and I actually talked to a, a trading professional about it. And he looked at me like I was nuts because to him, it was all about the money too. So I uh, thought about this, meditated about it, talked to my wife about it, talked to some of my, my friends, my spiritual leaders and so forth. And here's what I decided to do. So for me, one of my um, favorite charities in the world is called seva.org. Okay, and I'll, I don't know if everybody can see this or not, but I'm going to type it into the uh, chat box. And I have nothing to do with them other than I contribute to them. I'm not on the board or don't have any financial interest in them or whatsoever. But what they do is for 50, they do a lot of stuff, but the part that I participate in financially is that for $50, you can heal a blind child. 50 bucks. A kid that'll be blind for the rest of its life uh, you can give it sight. That's pretty amazing. And you can check out the website and, and see how, but uh, they would otherwise be blind for the rest of their lives, meaning they would also probably never get married, never get a job, they'd be a beggar. And, oh, they also can't see as if that's not bad enough. So their lives are just terrible. But I can turn that around for 50 bucks and so can you. So what I do is I just say, okay, instead of thinking about the money when I'm trading, I'm thinking how many blind kids can I heal today with my trading? And obviously I take a percentage of my, my trading uh, profit and uh, send that over to seva.org. And that cured me of my number one problem that I already mentioned, which was over trading. When I focus, when my mind is focused on, oh, I'm here to heal blind kids, all of a sudden I'm more careful about taking trades because it's not about points. It's not about numbers. It's not about PL. It's not about dollars or yen or euros or pesos or won. It's about these kids being blind for goodness sake. And so that made me slow down and say, okay, wait a minute. Is this a good enough trade that I'm more likely to be able to, you know, send some money and help uh, a kid have sight again. And that for me, solved my problem of over trading. So I'm going to finish with this. Becoming a successful trader, when you have this approach, and again, for you, might be a totally different uh, charity, might be your churches, whatever. Okay, you decide that between you and your family. And it has to be, and, and someone told me this, the right cause for you is the one that brings tears to your eyes. And I love that. The right cause for you is the one that brings tears to, you, to your eyes. Now, when you trade for that cause, all of a sudden, becoming a successful trader is not an option. It's your duty. It's your obligation. It's your responsibility. You must do it. And it's a mission. 
It's not just a job. It's not just fun. It is now a calling. It is a, not um, just a job. It's a vocation. So that's my um, that's my sermon for the day. <laughs> okay. But I share that with you because I don't hear that from a lot of traders and a top dog trading, you know, I, I integrated a number of years ago, personal development and spirituality into the trading. And this is a little sample of it. And I don't do that to make money. I do it to bring perspective because that's what helped me. And I think it makes the whole world a better place. So um, take it or leave it up to you, but I offer that to you. Okay. So that had zero to do with Fibonacci, but I think it had a lot to do with life. So let's move on. And now we'll actually talk about Fibonacci. All right. So we're going to start out. We're going to talk about several different Fibonacci techniques. I'll call them techniques. So let me bring up my little laser pointer here. Yeah, you can see that. Okay, so we'll start out by talking about Fibonacci retracements. And this is just, this slide is just to give you the big picture before we go into more detail. Um, because I used to start with slides after this, and then I realized people didn't understand the overall context. So I want to give you a big picture context here as to why we even use Fibonacci. And then we'll, we'll go into more detail. So big picture is something like this, where we get a, a big trend down, big move down, all right, from that high to that low. And the question is, all right, now we want resistance levels overhead to find where this market might stop and then put a swing high and go back down again. Okay, so what we do is we have a drawing tool, which uh, depending on your charting platform, you can ask your charting platform support team, you know, where the drawing tool is and et cetera, because it'll be different for each one. But you draw, uh, it's a two point um, drawing tool. So you, you click here, you drag it down to the low. So from a high to a low, and then you unclick. And then it'll automatically plot these retracement levels. And that's what it is. So will the market retrace 23.6% from that high to that low? That's what that level is. Or 38.2% back or 50% retraces half the way back. Or as you can see, if it retraces all the way back to the high, well, that's a 100% retracement. All right, so that's uh, the kind of thing it is. So bottom line is it's used for support and resistance levels. All right, so now what are these numbers? Where did they come from? How were they discovered, et cetera? Well, it's actually rooted in a sequence of numbers that was named after Leonardo of Pisa, who was known as Fibonacci, which simply means son of Benocchio. That's how they often referred to people back in those days. They would refer to the son uh, with reference to the father's name. Now, he introduced the sequence to the West in 1202. But like a lot of things in the West, the, um, the sequence before the East and the West really communicated a lot. The sequence, the sequence had already been used in India a long, long time before that. It doesn't really matter, but just there you go. So what are these Fibonacci numbers? Well, the root of them is not really those um, percentages. So where they really are is, and this is the heading up here, that's your Fibonacci sequence. So the sequence, which is the core of Fibonacci, is a sequence of numbers beginning with zero and one, and then each subsequent number is the sum of the previous two. Okay, again, the sequence of the numbers is you take the subsequent number, or the subsequent number is the sum of the previous two. So let me show you what I mean by that. So we started with zero, we had zero plus one equals one. Okay. Uh, this is high level math here. So you can probably tell I, have a, I don't have a PhD in mathematics from MIT because I, I can do, I learned this in uh, kindergarten. All right. And then now if we take this, okay, one plus one equals two. So one, if you look up in the header here, there's your sequence one plus one equals 
two. Everybody's still on board. <laughs> okay. So what are we doing here? Well, zero plus one equals one. So then you take one and one and you add those together and you get two. Okay. Then you take your one and your two here and you add those two together. One and one equals, or one plus two equals three. So our sequence is, this Fibonacci sequence is one, two, three. Well, do we really need any kind of math equation for that? And there it is up there, one, two, three. Okay, and here's where now it's the Fibonacci starts to kick in a little bit. Because now if you add the last two numbers, two and three, oh, we skip four and we get five. So the actual sequence is one, two, three, five. And now as you'll see, it'll take the last two digits of that previous equation, three and five, add those together, you get eight. So the sequence is one, three, five, eight. All right, and again, I don't need to belabor this point. And then five and eight equals 13. And there you see it, one, three, five, eight, 13, and 21 and on it goes. All right, we're not gonna, like I said, belabor all that point. But the question now is, okay, so that's the core of it, but why are they significant? So they're considered significant because they are found in the structure of multiple uh, natural patterns. So they are considered an organizing principle of nature. And I'm not very good at math. I don't know much about math. In fact, math was actually my worst subject in all of school. But uh, you know, smarter people than me tell me this is actually true. And so the reason that it was independently discovered mathematically in opposite parts of the world was because very smart people started studying nature and applying mathematical principles to it. And they started seeing that, oh, these patterns have ratios to them that are all mathematically consistent. And so that's where it came from. So in nature, it is definitely significant. It's uh, objectively there, just through observation. Uh, architecture will use it a lot uh, because it's very practical. Now in trading, uh, most people don't use the actual Fibonacci sequence. Some people do. WD GAN did, by the way, it can be used. Uh, I'm not going to talk about how to apply the sequence today. Perhaps other speakers have, and that's that's wonderful. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the ratios. So the ratios, um, each number in the sequence is approximately 1.618 times greater than the percent, a preceding number. And this is the foundations of the ratios. It's called the golden ratio or the golden mean. The other two ratios are then determined by dividing any number in the series uh, by the number two places to the left or three places, or I'm sorry, two places to the right or three places to the right. Okay, so let me just give you an example of that. So there's our sequence. So 61.8 found by dividing any number in the sequence that's found one place to the right of it. So if we start here, 1321. Okay, 13 divided by 21 is 0 0.619. Okay, then if we go to the next two, 21, 34, divide 21 by 34, 0 0.617. Very close, right? It's roughly 618. 34, 55, and that's what you'll see. Every single pair of these, that's one of the um, interesting things that just happened. So we start with the sequence, and then they started to notice, oh, wait a minute. When we divide these numbers by the number to the right of it, we always get uh, 0.618 approximately. So that is the primary, if you're a Fibonacci purist, that's your primary ratio. That's the golden ratio. And some people will just use that one and that one alone. And that's perfectly fine. That is the ratio. Now there's other ratios that people use, including myself, 38.2. And we'll find that this one is also consistent. But this one's found by dividing any number in the sequence that is found two places to the right of it. So real quickly, so we start with 13 again, but this time we go two numbers to the right of it, 34. And when you divide 13 by 34, you get your 0.382. 21, again, skip the one to the right, go two to the right. 
Okay, and there you go. 34, skip the 55, go to the 89, do the right. Again, you get your point 382. And then the 23 is found by doing the same thing, just going three places to the right. Again, I'm not going to go through all of them. You get the idea. All right, so again, if we look, start with a 13, now we skip three to the right, one, two, three. So we're going to divide 13 by 55, and we get our 0.236. And we could do that all the way through the Fibonacci sequence, which is essentially eternal, never ends. And you'll always get that ratio. Okay, so that's where those percentages come from. Now, there's a couple of other percentages that we use. Again, a 61.8 is the primary one. Uh, 3.2 and 23.6 are secondary Fibonacci ratios. So where do the other two, 50% and 76.4% come from? Well, first of all, 50% 50 is technically not really a Fibonacci ratio. Uh, I have seen some people come up with creative ideas as to explaining why it is. That's fine. I don't really care. I'm not going to argue the point. Uh, academically, again, I'm not a mathematician. I've seen the argument. Um, again, I just don't think it's important enough to have to defend. I've seen lit it rep or I've seen markets hold the 50% retracement level so many times. I'm just practical. I'm not interested in the theory or the mathematics of it. I'm just interested in, is it going to, is the 50% going to help me heal some blind kids? Right? That's how you always look at it. And the point is that, yeah, it does, the markets do, uh, people do buy off of this level, people sell off of this level, take, people do take profits to this level quite often. And WD GAN used this level a lot. So whether it came from Fibonacci or GAN, I don't care. I just want to know, is it going to help us make some money? And then 76.4, uh, that's also not a Fibonacci ratio. It's simply the mirror of the 23.6. In other words, 76.4 plus 23.6 equals 100. Now, some people, again, if you're more of a Fibonacci purist, then you would use 78.6 instead of 76.4. And that is a more, um, more numerically correct if you're into the numerology of it, simply because it's the square root of 0.618. Um, so why do I use 76.4? Again, because I'm practical. I'm more interested in the practicality of it. And when we're looking at the 76.4 and the markets are coming down to that level, it'll hit 76.4 before it hits 78.6. And I've just found that it, it, it will, if I use it as a target, for example, to take profits, I get filled there more often than if I wait for it to go to 78.6. Sometimes it never makes it quite there. And so if I set that as my target, it doesn't quite get there. And then I use a trailing stop and I make less money. So there you go. Okay, again, I don't believe that we as traders need to be this persnickety about these kind of details. So that's my two cents or 2%, 2.2%. 2 <laughs> All right, now there's of course many other types of uh, numbers that we can use, many other types of market geometry. And there's some really great ones. Gartley is good. Uh, some people's astrology, squares, that comes from GAN. That could all be great. I've looked at all of that. But in this particular webinar, we're gonna focus on just these ratios. So if you want to write them down, 0, 23.6, 38.2, 50, 61.8, 76.4, and 100. And we're going to look at them from different perspectives. So I'm going to teach you now. Now we're going to go into very specific techniques. Now that you understand the theory, the concept, uh, the origin. Now how do we apply this with different types of drawing tools on our charts? So the first one, of course, is our Fibonacci retracement. This one, pretty much everybody and their parakeet knows about who's been in trading for any um, length of time. So that's right. Parakeets are very good at Fibonacci. Very little known fact, by the way. Very little known. In fact, me and you are the only ones who know that now. So I showed you this chart. And again, all we're looking at is um, if it's a downtrend, 
then you draw it from the high to the low and you're looking at uh, potential resistance. Now, just because we have these lines on here does not mean the market is going to stop at these lines. So therefore the word potential is critical to always use. Don't I don't like to say, well, this is resistance. No, it's the 23.6 is potential resistance. And in this case, the market just sliced through it like butter. Right, this is the, the DAX and, um, in, in Germany. And so it just sliced through like butter. So did it provide resistance at this time? No, not at all, not at all. In fact, it even kind of gapped through it a little bit there. All right, and that's a two minute chart. For, so for it to gap through it, a two minute chart is showing a lot of energy to the upside. So potential. And by the way, um, I'm gonna mention something else while we got this, uh, this slide up here. Notice, and this, this to me, this goes back to the practicality of my, my perspective on trading. Notice how close 23.6 is to 25. In other words, about a quarter. So I'm gonna, let me put it this way. When the market moves to this level, it's going up, it's retracing about a quarter of the way back up. Here it's moving up about a third of the way back up. Here about a half of the way back up. Here about two thirds of the way back up. Here about three quarters of the way back up. Now, the average person trading, they're not trading and they're not going to get in and out at exactly a certain percentage. But what's going on in their mind, the average human being, when they're thinking in fractions, they're thinking things like this. They're thinking, well, uh, let's see, I'm up 25%. Or, gone dang, I just lost 25% of my money. Or I'm up a third, or I'm down a third. Or, oh, I made 50% on this trade. Or I made, um, you know, two thirds of my money or I lost two thirds of my money or three quarters. These are the natural fractions that most people default to. Very few people will say, oh gosh, I'm up five sixteenth. Right? The, no, it's a quarter, third, half, two thirds, three quarters. And roughly, they're not measuring it to the penny, to the pip, to the tick. So, Coincidence that these Fibonacci ratios just happen to fall within a very close parameter of those. And again, look, it's like, oh, yeah, but Barry, two thirds, that's not really two thirds, that's 61.8. Yeah, but look where the market went. It went above the 61.8. And so again, these are zones, not lines. And so it is my postulation and this is just my hypothesis, is that the, re, you know, Fibonacci, again, it does have very clear objective mathematical applications in nature. We see the structure of nature. There is a Fibonacci uh, application there for sure that we have just discovered and been independently discovered by several different people in different um, continents and at different times, because it's there. Architecture, yes works very, very well to create solid structures. But I think it's a leap to say that therefore, because a Nautilus shell has a ratio of 61.8, therefore uh, the futures, the Euro, crypto has to move in these same ratios. I think that's a pretty big leap. I think that's a pretty big assumption. I don't think it's a big assumption to say, well, it's human beings trading the market. And our natural inclination is to look at making a quarter or losing a quarter, a third, a half, two thirds, or three quarters in that area. And again, you notice it doesn't stop right on these lines. It's a little bit above it, a little bit above it, uh, a little bit, you know, bullet just kind of hovers around the 50% level. To me, uh, that's why Fibonacci ratios, quote unquote, work. And people have applied them now that people have applied them and they said, oh, look, it works. Fibonacci's in the markets. 
it now has become a self-fulfilling prophecy because now not only do we have people projecting their rough percentages onto the market, now we actually have people who are using these tools because now these tools have been added to most every trading platform out there. And that eats even more to their effectiveness because now, because people use the tools, they actually now have a self-fulfilling prophecy of just masses of people using them. Now, does it matter? No, it doesn't matter if I'm right or wrong or what my hypothesis or thesis is. The only matter is, well, all that matters is are these levels significant for support resistance? And for all the reasons I just said, yes, they are. Therefore, we use them. Okay, so, um, but again, potential. So slices through this one, slices through 38.2, goes to 50. There it stops. Now we put in a swing high down there. It goes down through 38. And it puts finally puts in a swing high, not at 38, but this time at 23.6 goes back up. Now, this time it slices through 50, and it goes up to 61.8. This time it slices through 38, goes back down to 23. And so now the big question becomes, well, Dagnabbit, how do I know which of these Fibonacci levels are going to hold and which ones we're going to slice through? And that's a good question. And I will be addressing that soon. But before I do, let me just show you something up to date. Today is uh, September 8th. And so I just literally did a screen capture of this chart today. I thought I'd show this. So here's our Fibonacci retracements on the S&P 500 daily chart. And you can see we have this major swing low here. By the way, I like to draw my Fibonacci levels from the uh, candles. Well, from the candles, but from the real bodies. Some people do it from the high and the low. That's okay too. You know, it's a preference. Um, I find that the the wicks, the high and the low of the wicks, um, kind of an extreme. I find that the real value of the market was settled more around the real bodies, the colored levels of the body. So you can see that's a question I get asked often. So as you can see, I drew it from the real body there to the real body there. And now as we look at our retracements, there's your 23.6. Market did come down and again, went a little below it, held it for a little bit, and then boom, sliced through 38, uh, hesitated, well, no, pretty much sliced through 50. And we have held the golden ratio here, 0.618. And we had a nice big candlestick popping off of that one. And again, going up a little bit this day. So has definitely applied and been practical in the market right now. That's where we are right now. Okay, so now let's talk about a second tool. So we talked about Fibonacci retracements. Retracements are for um, when the market moves back toward the initial, um, where the tr trend started from, okay? And we're looking for for retracements. Extensions are for targets. So let me put it this way. Retracements I usually use to get into trend continuation trades. I'm asking, all right, we've started a trend. I want to continue to trade in the trend. So I'm looking for the market to retrace a bit and then trade in the direction of the trend, get back in on a retracement. Now, Fibonacci extensions are used for a different purpose. These are for profits, for targets. Where do I want to get out? Now, this is a three-point drawing tool. So you click, you wait for a, uh, a trend, and we get our high to our low. Okay, we could have drawn our Fibonacci retracements there. But for the extensions, we have to do three clicks. Click, click, and then we've got to do one more click. We wait for the next high, and we click there. Now, you'll notice that these ratios are drawn below where our final click was, whereas the Fibonacci retracements drew above where our final click was. And that's because now we're looking for a target, profit targets. And so now the same ratios, okay, ratios don't change, but now we're looking for, all right, when will this end? So came all the way down, pretty much sliced through all of these. It did bounce off the 76.4. If you took profits there, I would say that's a reasonable thing to do. Came back up, hit the 38.2. 
and then finally went down to the 100 level. That's called a measured move, by the way. If you're going to use Fibonacci extensions, you should very much be aware of it. measured moves. They are probably the most used Fibonacci extension that people are looking for for profit taking. And it literally just means the move from that high where we clicked our last click on our tool to that low, that's a, the same distance in price as from the initial two clicks, 100%. Now, another thing we could do is we can look for Fibonacci clusters. And what this does is it just increases your odds even more that a support resistance level is likely to hold. So in this case, and you can draw Fibonacci clusters many, many different ways. Don't have time to go through all the ways today, but uh, we'll use the two examples that we already used. So um, we'll start out, we just draw Fibonacci retracement from that low to that high. And then here's our retracements, 23% back, 38, 50% back, 61%, 76% retracement back toward 100% retracement. So these numbers here and these lines over here on the far left, that's your retracement support levels. And then I also put on the Fibonacci extension. So one, two, three, and now it plots the lines above that third low. So there we go. Boom, 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 boom. As you can see now, we've got two lines from the two different tools that kind of intersect here. And so that is a very, very good support level, a little stronger than others. So again, when we're asking ourselves the question, well, how far is this going to retrace? Obviously, it did not hold the 23 at this time at all, just sliced right through it. One thing you always want to look at is your candlesticks. I mean, if there's no green candlestick here, why would I buy off the 23? It's just potential support. And now when I see a cluster of support, now why is this a higher probability? Again, practical uh, stuff here, because I'm not really that much into numerology. Um, it's not bad. It can be good. W. D. Gann was a master of it. I'm not a master of it. So um, I just do what I know. And the reason that uh, I feel that this is a strong uh, clusters in general, whether it's drawn this way or any other way, is because you have different people who are using different drawing tools. So again, self-fulfilling prophecy. So let's say that you got some people drawing your Fibonacci retracements. That means they're going to see this level at 38.2. And then you got other traders who are drawing the Fibonacci extensions, and they're going to see that level. So you have two different groups of traders, meaning if more traders seeing this zone as you would if you just used one tool. All right, now let's get into some more advanced stuff, okay? Those are the basics. That's like kindergarten, first grade, third grade, elementary school, Fibonacci. Good stuff. But now let's get into some more advanced things that a lot of people don't use. So the first two I showed you measure price levels. And that's how most people use Fibonacci is for price level support resistance. And it's great. Now we're going to add the element of time. And why is time important? Time is very important. You know, W.D. Gann talked a lot about time, measuring time in the market. And it was a great contribution that for some reason, unbeknownst to me, is no longer emphasized. And it should be emphasized because if you think about it, a chart is a two-dimensional object. It has a y-axis and an x-axis. The y-axis is your price levels. Well, sure, everybody in their parakeet talks about price levels or resistance, and they should. That's hugely important. But wait, there's only one other dimension to this two-dimensional object we lovingly call a chart. And that's the x-axis, which is your time. So if you don't have any sort of timing tool, you're ignoring 50% of the information on the two-dimensional object. And if you, I mean, this is an odds game, right? This is a, a, a business of trading odds. So how can you trade with good odds if you're intentionally leaving off 50% of the information on a chart? makes no sense. And by the way, I would say that this is where most traders have more problems than they do with price support resistance. They have problems with 
timing. In fact, my mentor at the CME, he said to me one time, he said, Barry, amateur, or he called them retailers. He said, retailers often write, but at the wrong time. And I'll never forgot that. That was decades ago. And I still never forgot that. So Fibonacci time extensions. So the way we're going to draw this is we're going to go from this low to that high. Okay, this little line here shows you that. I, I put the line down here just so you could see price. I didn't want it to cover the price action. So that's where we drew the line, the, our uh, tool from. Fibonacci time tool, click and click. So 100%. Now it'll put lines out into the future. And those are always going to be over 100%. So here we got, again, same ratios, right? There's just a one before them because it's 100%. So 123.6. And you notice, again, in this zone, don't get too persnickety. We're thinking, oh, it's got to shift right on the bar of the line. Now, market's a little noisier than that. But we're looking in this zone for the market to put in a cycle low. And it does. Boom. Comes back down. 138. Yep. Boom. Nailed it. 150, again, nailed it. 161.8, nailed it. Now, something else to notice on this chart. There's other swing highs and lows. There's a swing high here, no Fibonacci time extension. Swing low here, no Fibonacci time extension. So these are really good, but don't have an unrealistic expectation that they're going to identify every single swing high and low. They are not, and that's okay. We just trade the ones that it does identify. The others we let go because, hey, we got to let somebody else make money. You can't have all the money, right? You got to let somebody else make some money. I mean, you know, Goldman Sachs has a yacht fund that they need to, you know, stockpile some cash into. So don't deprive them of that. All right. Just kidding. I have nothing against Goldman Sachs, by the way. Huge respect, in fact, because, well, there's the smart money. Uh, 345140 is asking, do you trade with the FIB fan? Is that the name on your birth certificate? <laughs> um, I, I personally do not. Okay. It can be good. Oh, again, there's a lot of things that can be used very, very well, um, but you can only trade with so much, otherwise you get information overload. Okay, um, so let's go to the next one because I'm just looking at my clock here. And if I have, I don't mean to, um, who you pick the 100%, who you pick? Not sure what you mean by that. Um, okay, so let's go to Fibonacci time and price tools. Now, this one is really cool. This one, is, and what should they be called in your trading platform? They're either Fibonacci circles or Fibonacci arcs. Could be called either one. Different trading platforms call the North. So again, we take a major high to a major low. Click, click. And now look what it draws. Arcs. You see how the other ones were straight lines, horizontal or um, vertical lines. These are not, these are arcs. See how they curve? And so what they do is the mark will ride the arc of the circle and then break in the opposite direction. And so the cool thing about this tool is it's measuring time or price and time with one tool. So price comes up, 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 and then collapses. Again, there's no uh, arc here. That's okay. We just wait for the next one. Gets this one, and boom, back down it goes. So one tool that measures both price and time. Now, having said all of that, I said something earlier that was very, very important. I'm going to cover it here rather quickly right now. Don't have a lot of time to go into it, but it must be addressed. And that is that I said, okay, we've got these support resistance levels, but how do we know which ones are going to hold and which ones are not going to hold? So using Fibonacci, using support resistance of any type, and, and Fibonacci is a subset of support resistance. 
but support resistance levels on your chart are not enough. We have to add, and I call that structure, by the way. So anything to do with um, price patterns, support resistance, what you see on the, the top part of your graph, I call that structure, market structure. But now we have to add something else. And this I call the energy of the market. The energy is the money flow, the supply demand of the market, the buying and the selling pressure. So there's five energies that I measure. Trend, number one. Momentum, that's the strength of the trend. Cycles, now that's your timing again. Time your highs and your lows. Support resistance, previous swing highs and lows, waves, Fibonacci fits into that. And then I also use a higher time frame. I call that the fractal energy. And I use a three to one ratio between my short term and my time, uh, short term time frame and my long term time frame. I never take a trade unless it's confirmed by momentum, not trend, but momentum on the higher time frame. Never. That is a uh, filter that would filter me out of taking a trade. So when I'm determining whether I want to actually enter a trade, I ask myself this simple question. How many of the energies are aligned? Those five energies. So I'm giving each trade a score of one, two, five. When people take my course, there's literally a half piece of paper or a half sheet of paper with a uh, five-step scorecard. And um, that summarizes the entire trading system. So obviously, the higher the score, the higher the probability. I liken this to taking each trade to court. We need five independent witnesses to establish a preponderance of the evidence. So I'll show you this real quick, because this doesn't really have a lot to do with Fibonacci other than this is what I put on top of Fibonacci to measure the energy of money flow and help me to determine which support resistance levels are going to hold. So first thing is trend, right? That's the direction. This comes first because, well, if the trend is up, we only want to buy. If this trend is down, we only want to short or buy puts. So it's a binary decision. And if there's no trend, we just don't want to trade. So that's the very first thing, all right? Establish the trend. Now you know, okay, do I want to be bullish or bearish? The second one is momentum. Now, this tells you whether that trend is strong or weak. So we've got an uptrend here, higher high, higher low, higher high, higher low, higher high. And that's all great, except for one problem. Now, our momentum indicator down here, we've got a higher high, higher low, higher high, whoa, oh, lower low. See how there's a higher low on price, but a lower low on momentum and another lower low on momentum. That means that trend is about to end. And you know the old saying, the trend is your friend until the end. Well, how do we know when the trend is going to end? You can't tell on price until it's shifted, until you get a lower high on price. Well, by that time, you've already given back a lot of money on a trailing stop. So we look at momentum. Momentum can lead price by showing when that trend gets weakened. And weakened literally means there's not as much buying power behind it, not as much money behind it. Now, cycles, again, very important. In fact, I referred to this earlier. W.D. Gann actually said timing is more important than price. And my mentor said retailers are often right, but at the wrong time. So I use a cycle indicator down here. And this actually shows me when to get it, what time. Here's my time. Okay. So that's a good time to go short. That's a good time to go short. That's a good time to go short. But we have to use trend first because we're only going to go short on cycle highs in a downtrend. And we're only going to go long cycle lows in an uptrend. And then we bring in our support resistance. And here's our Fibonacci. So again, 50%. And if I put it all together, you can see we've got our retracements level goes back up, 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 up. There's your cycle high at the 50% Fibonacci. Look at the momentum, very weak momentum above the zero line. That's your zero line. So markets will not break through. Well, in order to break through resistance, markets need strength. 
and strength just means buying power, demand. And this, indicators are math functions, and it is mathematically telling you, no, there's not enough strength to break through that resistance level. And so it's time. So we've got a resistance level. It's actually a cluster of that high and 50 Fibonacci. So it's a cluster. We've got an engulfing candlestick. We've got a cycle high and we've got weak momentum up and the trend is down. And that's a beautiful, that's my rubber band trade, by the way. I'll show you how to get the rubber band trade for free here in a minute. And then finally, the very, very last thing that I look at is the fractal energy. Again, I'm using two charts. Two, I've got a two minute over here, a three minute or six minute over here. Whatever time frames you want to use is fine, but should be a one to three ratio. And again, I don't care what the trend is on the longer term time frame, but I will only take a trade on the shorter term time frame if it's in the direction of momentum of the long term. Remember, momentum means strength. So I want there to be bearish strength on the short term chart and bearish strength on the long term chart. So trend is down, cycle high, resistance at that level right there. Momentum's down here, momentum's down here, and that creates a big move down, big reward. So my risk is the range of that bar, and my reward, well, it's big. So uh, this approach is very robust, works for all markets, all time frames. Uh, you can do this for day trading, swing trading. You can do it with pretty much any market. So my time is done, and unfortunately, I didn't bring anything to sell you today. So I'm sorry. I know you guys are really miffed that I don't have anything to sell you, but I do have something free. So I mentioned real quickly my rubber band trade there. I showed you a quick example. Didn't have time to go into detail, obviously, because we were our next speaker coming up in just two minutes. So I'm just going to give you the rubber band trade strategy for free. How's that? Give you one of my courses for free. So um, all you have to do is just go to rubberbandtrade.com and you can pick this up 100% uh, free. What you're going to get in this course is my rubber band trade strategy. You can trade this, obviously. Please trade it on a demo account or a simulator first. Prove to yourself that you can make money with it. And then that's my gift to you. Make money. And if you want to buy my courses later, you can. If you don't want to, that's fine too. Whatever. Uh, I'm just here to serve you. And the course is talked or is called How to Make Money by Breaking Every tr uh, Trading Rule You Ever Learned. It's got five little videos in it. There are quizzes at each one. So you get feedback, make sure you're on track. And then that cycle indicator I shared with you, that's included as well. I'll show you how to set that up. So all of that, 100% free. And uh, there you go. David just typed it in, rubberbandtrade.com. Yep, that is the link. Thank you. And by the way, if once in a while we have a problem, that's a redirect. It's a, what they call a pretty link. So every once in a while, the pretty link uh, doesn't work for some people's browsers or whatever. So I just typed in the ugly link. <laughs> that's the direct link in case the, uh, the pretty one doesn't work. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. I appreciate uh, the invite, appreciate being here, and uh, I'd better go and um, let everybody transition to the next speaker.